This is a line of people waiting for Metrobus Route 7 in Mexico City. Waiting for transit is something we can all relate to, but these people are not waiting for the bus to arrive. The buses are passing every 90 seconds. No, they're waiting since each bus that does arrive is almost completely full and can't squeeze in everybody who's queuing at the station. For some North American viewers, this may seem like a foreign concept, unless you count waiting for Space Mountain at Disneyland. But this happens a lot in many parts of the world, including in this North American example. So today we're going to look at this bus line as a case study for a broader issue. What do you do when a transit line has reached its physical capacity limit and still can't keep up with demand? Welcome to Transit World, videos on all things transportation, with a focus on the developing world. Mexico City's BRT network, Metrobus, is just impressive. It carries around 1.5 million daily riders, a bit over 500 million per year. If it were its own metro system, it would be the 39th largest in the world, ahead of places like Barcelona, Munich, Toronto. For a U.S. comparison, Mexico City's Metrobus carries more people than the subways in Washington, D.C., Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Combined. It's an incredible system, especially since Metrobus is not the only BRT, or bus priority system, that serves Mexico City. The four Mexibus lines and the eight STE trolleybus lines add around another 200 million annual passengers, making the total on BRT, or similar rapid bus, in Greater Mexico City around 700 million passengers annually more than even the Goliath Transmilenio system. Line 7 is the newest line on the Metrobus system, opening in 2018. It slices across the northwest of the city core, traveling from Campo Marte, up Reforma, arguably the most important street in Mexico, ending in the massive transit hub of Indios Verdes. Unlike most of the Metrobus system, Line 7 is really BRT light. It boards and alights at curbside stations that are mostly open-aired, mostly without prepayment turnstiles, and although the route operates in a dedicated bus lane, it does so mainly on the curb side of the street, not the center, except for a portion of the northern part of the route where it has its own right-of-way. In the context of BRT in Mexico City, Metrobus line seems small and insignificant. It's BRT light, which doesn't even rank on ITDP's BRT scorecard index. It has the second lowest ridership of all the lines, carrying only about 8% of Metrobus riders. Of course, it is still quite busy, carrying around the same number of people as the entire metro system in Naples, Italy, or Brasilia, Brazil. But what makes Line 7 special is how its demand overwhelms supply on this route. During peak hours, Line 7 is truly maxed out, in a way few other bus routes are. This makes it an interesting case study on what happens when you reach the physical limits of what a transit route can do, and how to deal with that. Line 7 has reached the point where it's pretty much impossible to provide more transit supply without capital investment in infrastructure. There are already frequent buses once per 90 seconds during peak hours, and this is right at the limit of the practical maximum frequency for a light BRT system, since dwell times, red lights, and other small delays start to have a longer variance than the headways, which leads to bus bunching and inefficiencies. Despite these maximized frequencies, essentially every bus operates at crush load the highest number of people you can legally, and often physically, cram onto the bus. At many stations, the people queuing to get on the bus exceeds the number of spaces available, meaning people have to wait for several buses to pass before they can board. Two side notes. First, yes, that's right, I'm going to use the word queue. Very un-American, I know. But the UK had the top transit wonder in my last video, so consider this a small verbal recognition to that honor. Also, this entire episode is focused on red double-decker buses made by a British company. Second, in traffic engineering, we often deem traffic levels to be failing if you have to wait more than one light cycle before passing an intersection, a designation that often triggers requirements to upgrade infrastructure or improve vehicular flow. Would it really be too much to have this same standard for transit when you have to wait for more than one bus? You could even build these costs into development fees just like we do for traffic. So for example, if you have a new building that's projected to increase transit demand by X riders over the acceptable level of service, then you have to pay to help cover the cost to increase transit supply by X riders. Anyway, when these buses are running smoothly, these queues at the stations are manageable, but just like traffic approaching capacity, it only takes the slightest slowdown to trigger a tipping point. Even just a one minute delay is enough to fill a station queue with dozens of people, which then creates a backlog which takes quite some time to clear. So the result is often excess waiting at the stations before you board, then pretty much guaranteed crush loads once you board, except if you're lucky enough to find a seat upstairs where standing is prohibited, and excess congestion along the bus lane since buses running at their maximum physical frequencies often bunch up. And these problems are exacerbated by the typical limitations of a BRT light system. The curb running bus lane is often filled with non-compliant traffic, traffic turning and merging, 
other buses who share the right of way, both legally using it and otherwise. Also, trees, which encroach into the lane at regular intervals, causing buses to regularly swerve out of the bus lane. A particular issue for the uniquely tall buses, which do occasionally clip branches. In fact, city officials even have a program where they tag and monitor problematic trees and set up bollards to warn bus drivers. Boarding is also slower than standard BRT since fares are typically paid while boarding, except at some of the major stops, and the buses only have two doors. Line 7 also deals with some unique issues associated with its route. Avenida Reforma is iconic. It has the prestige of Fifth Avenue in New York, the cultural importance of the National Mall in DC, and the business concentration of Market Street in San Francisco. In fact, it was this reverence to Reforma, which was a large reason Line 7 was built only as a BRT light to start with. People didn't want large buses blocking views, nor center lane stations that changed the vibe of the street. Not saying this was the right call, but these cultural concessions were important to getting the project through. Also, the iconicism of the road means people like to go there to do things that require the road to close. Most parades and events take place along the street, including the Ciclovia, which uses the BRT lanes every Sunday. There's also frequent strikes and protests. Seems like nearly a third of the time I've been to Reforma, there's some sort of protest going on, including the day I was filming, and then again a week later when I was putting this video together. And even a small protest is enough to bifurcate Line 7 service. Protests are great for civil engagement, but not for transit planning. And don't get me wrong, I love this route. It's a workhorse that provides mobility to many people, it squeezes incredible ridership out of a curb-running bus route, plus the buses are iconic themselves and offer fantastic views from the top. But it's a route that's the victim of its own success. Can't keep up with demand. Side note, you can make the argument that overcrowding is just as big, if not a bigger issue to transit ridership than frequency or speed. Crush loads are rarely reached in many parts of the world, especially in places where fewer people take transit, but it happens a lot in the developing world and can provide an existential crisis for the reputation and ridership demand for transit systems. Even for somebody who is a huge advocate of transit, it's immensely unpleasant to be on a bus or a train with so many people that you can't even reach for your phone, it's hard to get a fresh breath of air, and you start sweating from those stuffy conditions. Not to mention all the personal safety issues. I do know several people, including transit professionals, that refuse to commute on transit in Mexico City and other places in the Global South because it's so overcrowded even when it's faster and cheaper than driving. This is a classic application of the saying, no one goes there anymore, it's too crowded. But when people don't go on transit, they are likely to either contribute to traffic, of which Mexico City has the worst in the world, or they just forgo the trip altogether, both of which are bad. So what should we do? The obvious answer is to upgrade the route to a full BRT with center lane service, free boarding payment, and high capacity buses, or perhaps just jump all the way to constructing a metro. And sure, these are good ideas in the medium to long term, but they've so far proven politically infeasible. And also, if you're one of the 120,000 daily riders, these options are not likely to impact your commute for quite some time, maybe not even until after you retire. So what are some changes we can make that increase transit supply in the short term? Before I get to my proposed solutions, please remember to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content. Also, let me know in the comments what you think of the channel in general. Are videos on one bus line too specific? Do I talk too much about Mexico? I mean, I kind of live there part-time, so it's just an easy place to film. But if you want to fund my trip to Manila or Jakarta or Cairo, I'd be happy to accept. Part of my influence for today's video comes from some research my friend and former colleague, Adam Davidson, is working on, looking at what he dubs abundant transit. Small, incremental changes that can help provide more service, more often, with less friction. I've linked to some of his work in the show notes. All right, now let's see how we can indeed create more abundant transit for Metroboost Line 7. Well. It's not as simple as just adding more buses. This won't work when the system is maxed out. Since you're at the point where the schedule variation exceeds headways during peak hours, frequency is not the limiting constraint on capacity. Frequency itself is constrained. You can make the buses bigger, that will help increase capacity, but you may wash out the benefit with larger delays articulated buses could cause since they take up more physical space. And yeah, it seems ridiculous that a bus that's just 20 feet longer can cause extra delay, but when your system is performing at such maximum frequencies, this actually is an issue. Also, articulated buses only fit about 30 more people than double-deckers, so the capacity increase would not be dramatic. Also, also, adding articulated buses would require the station infrastructure to all be changed to accommodate them. And I think there are actually much better ways to use that infrastructure investment to improve service while keeping the same buses you currently have. At the end of the day, I think there are two things you need to do. The first is to decrease time, speed up the buses between stations, and decrease dwell time at the stations and decrease schedule variability. 
keep the bus right of ways clear and minimize variable timings at intersection. So let's take over an extra lane and have two bus lanes in each direction. This will allow for passing and dealing with lane encroachment and tree encroachment. And yeah, of course, people will inevitably complain about taking a lane away from cars, but even just one extra bus trip on the schedule can add the same capacity as around 100 cars on the road take up. So I think you can get people behind this. You could also put up a stronger barrier to separate general purpose lanes from the bus lanes, elongate select stations so that line seven buses have a dedicated space to stop that is not shared or impeded by other buses that also use part of the corridor. Let's also consider implementing pre-boarding payment at each station, or at least at most stations. And let's implement more aggressive signal preemption, especially for areas with high bus lane encroachment and at large intersections and roundabouts. All these would be relatively simple changes to implement that would require modest investment compared to converting to a full BRT or certainly building a subway. So what would be the impact of all of this? Well, I did run an analysis to estimate that. I looked at the current timings for line seven, both the times buses take from station to station and the amount of dwell time they spend at each station. Then I determined the run and dwell times for stretches of full BRT lines that run near line seven. These numbers are based on GTFS data, which I then spot checked and adjusted based on site visits. With the changes I propose, I think you could get line seven to operate between the stations at speeds similar to other BRT lines. Yeah, it would still be a curb running BRT, but you'd have two lanes, which would give a big advantage and is something that most other Metrobus lines don't have. I think you could also reduce dwell times as well. Not quite as low as what you see on the full BRT with four plus doors, but I conservatively estimate that you could reduce it by about six seconds per stop. With these assumptions, you would reduce the time to run the full route from the current 65 minutes down to a little less than 50. That means that without changing the number or types of buses at all, you could increase headways from the current 90 seconds down to around 70 seconds, and you would have the infrastructure and schedule reliability to accommodate this. This translates to 32% more capacity per hour, while also improving travel times. So would this be enough to eliminate station queues and overcrowding on buses? I don't know. It likely would at first, but it's hard to say if induced demand would increase ridership and cause overcrowding again. But even if it does, those upgrades are still worth it. Not only do they increase the number of riders and decrease transit times, but they also show Metrobus and the public tangible evidence that this should be a viable route to update, whether that's to full BRT or to Metro. Small incremental changes are not sexy, but they often are what truly moves the needle. Whether that's adding buses to a route that shows promise but is infrequent, increasing span of service, or expanding bits of infrastructure like this case, with station fare boxes or heavier barriers to protect bus lanes. In fact, small incremental changes were exactly what led to the creation of Line 7 in the first place, a BRT light treatment that organized the eclectic bus services that preceded it. And if you continually work to make these small changes, they quickly do add up to something that actually is quite consequential. That's all I have for today. Please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.